About 250 years ago, Benjamin Franklin published in Poor Richard's Almanac this little ditty. It's about a nail, a short little nail that you would use to affix a horseshoe to the bottom of a horse's hoof. And it went like this. For the want of a nail, the shoe was lost. For the want of a shoe, the horse was lost. For the want of a horse, the rider was lost. For the want of a rider, the battle was lost. And for the want of a battle, the kingdom was lost. And all for the want of a horseshoe nail. Now, we've all heard that or something like it, and we understand what it means. It's trying to help us to understand or appreciate that when something is small, we have a small, manageable problem. It's better to address it then than to have to face a problem that's much bigger later on. We're going to take that counsel and we're going to apply it to the batteries and the charging systems in our classic British cars. The first thing we want to remember is that a battery all by itself will not hold a charge indefinitely. Even if you put a kill switch in, it will not hold a charge indefinitely. So if your car is going to be sitting for a couple of weeks or longer, a maintenance charger, also called a battery tender, is a very good idea. It's a very good idea for reasons you might not know about yet. This is Moss's 386245. This is an example of a maintenance charger or battery tender. And as you can see, it's small. They're all like that. You can hide it. You can put it in an inconspicuous place in the car. And they have a plug. You're going to attach an extension cord to this. So when the car is going to be parked for a while, just plug it in. The other end is going to have a pair of wires. One's going to go to the ground of the car. The other's either going to go to the battery or a cable going to the battery. If the car is reverse polarity, just simply reverse the wires. It's just that easy. This will keep the battery fully charged. So if the car is parked for a while and you happen to have a parasitic draw, or you face the natural discharge an automotive battery is going to suffer, your battery will remain fully charged. Now in a typical setting, if our battery is discharged, we haul off the jumper cables, we connect them to the start to start the crippled car, and once the car starts, we remove the jumper cables. With the car now running, her own charging system will come to life and recharge the drained battery. That's true, and most of us have done it that way since tires with tubes were state-of-the-art. The issue is this. The car's charging system is capable of recharging the battery, but that's tough on the battery and it's tough on the charging system. The charging system was designed to recharge the battery after it lost a little power to start the car. After that, all the charging system was designed to do is produce enough current to run the lights and the ignition system. It was designed with the purpose to maintain the battery, not to resuscitate it. Completely recharging a badly discharged battery was not part of the plan. Your generator or your alternator was simply not built for that. So why is this a problem, especially since we've done it this way forever? Well, when the generator or the alternator is working more than it was built for, it will face heat and stresses it was not designed to face. It can't get rid of the heat fast enough. Things inside begin to get hot, the kind of hot that does damage. This technician went into the Moss Motors Returns Department and got a couple of starter cores, or excuse me, generator cores. Before we get into that, a core, in case you're not familiar with that, is, a, is an item like a generator, a starter, an alternator, which has been in somebody's car and it finally wore out. What they will do is they will buy a replacement, a rebuild unit, put that in their car, and now they're good as new again. They take theirs, which has failed, and they send it back so it can be rebuilt and sold to somebody else. This is what a core is. What I'm holding right here is a generator core. Now, I got a couple of them, and fortunately, the very first one I opened is exactly what I wanted to show you. I'm going to take the two um, bolts out of this. They're all loosened and ready to come. This end piece here is the end plate. The brushes are inside. In fact, the brushes are spring-loaded, and if you listen, you probably hear them pop out when I do this. Hear that? There's your two brushes right there. There's one, and there's the other right there. They sit and ride on the armature, which is in here on the bars in the armature. And I'm going to remove the case so you can see that. I'll put that over here. So this is the armature. This is the part that spins. So while this is working, it's trying to make electricity, these windings that you see around the middle right here, these are the current generating windings. The electricity is formed in here. It travels up through these spiral wires that you can see, and each one is soldered to one of these bars. The, bars, the brushes right here ride on the bars. They pick up the current and carry it off to the car. That's how the system works. Now imagine that this is running. Imagine we're running it harder than it was built to be run.
Okay, so she's spinning really, really fast. Our battery was dead. We left the lights on at the mall or something like that. Somebody gave us a jump start. And now this is trying to recharge the whole battery. She's spinning fast. She's working. She's getting hot and hotter and hotter. And right along in here where all these joints are, these joints are where the wires come in and are affixed to the bars, are held in place with solder. Well, as this is spinning and the solder gets hotter and hotter and hotter, what happens? The solder turns to a liquid. If you put a liquid on something that's spinning really, really fast, it's going to throw it. The centrifugal force will literally throw the melted solder right out of there. What does that do? Let's take a peek over here. This is the inside of the case that I took off. And I'm going to ask you, I hope you're, you're going to be able to see this with your eyes. And there's a silver ring right around the inside of the case. You can see it clearly along there. And what you're looking at as you look at that ring, what that is right there is that is melted solder. It was on this armature that was spinning really, really fast, and the solder got thrown off and stuck to the walls. That's what that is. Now, if we go back to this for just a moment, if I've got a bad joint here, and I've lost the solder, and the solder's been thrown off, I'm going to lose one of these contact points. What's going to happen is the generator is going to continue to work, but she's lost a percentage of her capacity because I just lost this contact. If that happens, that's the smaller of the two problems that you can face. The big problem is in here. Right here, this is the terminal where the field wires go. These send power in, it goes down, there's a wire right there that crosses that silver line and goes to the field windings. And the voltage regulator sends power in here to get the field windings to come to life, so this will make electricity. Well, the wire, like all the wires you've seen in your life, is covered with a vinyl coating. When you hit vinyl with hot melted solder, what's going to happen? In the first instant, the solder is going to melt the vinyl right off. Right after that, more solder hits it, and it's going to form a bridge that conducts electricity between the now exposed wire and the metal case. This wire is shorted. This generator at this moment right now is dead, and that's where she's going to go. Now, we have a voltage regulator. The voltage regulator isn't smart enough to know that something's wrong down here. Her job is simple. If the voltage in the car goes down below a certain point, she's going to send electricity to this lead right here to tell these windings to come to life, to tell this to make more electricity. So the voltage has dropped down because the generator just died. She doesn't know that, so she starts pumping electricity into here. The electricity goes into here, goes to a dead short. So she says nothing's happening, and she puts more and more and more electricity in, and as she does that, the contact points that are supposed to be opening and closing, letting electricity in and burst, are now just closed. They weren't built for that, there's too much heat, and in a very short period of time, the voltage regulator is also dead. Now if we think about it, and it's amazing, the generator and the voltage regulator, or if you have an alternator with an internal regulator, usually will survive this kind of heavy charging. Okay? That's why we usually get away with it. That's a tribute to the way that these units were built. Failures like this one don't happen as often as you might expect. But did we really get away with it? Well, sometimes yes and sometimes no. If we lost the solder, for example, that was holding one of these connections together, okay, we still have a functioning generator, but as we've mentioned, we lost a percentage of our total potential output. The rest of these parts in here are still functioning. So what's going to happen is these are going to have to work extra hard to make up for the one or the two that have failed when they lost their solder and threw it across there. As these work extra hard, they work in hotter and hotter and hotter. We get them into another tough spot and a cascading effect begins to happen. We lost the first one, now we're going to lose the second one. As this gets hotter, we're going to lose another one. And eventually, we're going to lose the whole thing. What's interesting is that it's not uncommon after getting a jump start, for example, to suffer the loss of a generator or an alternator or a battery a short time later. We may not link the two events together. They may be separated by a couple of days or a couple of weeks, but that's exactly what happened. The problem that we had from the jump start and the harm that we did to the generator, the alternator, the voltage regulator, back then eventually found its way to full manifestation and we stopped again. Now, beyond what the charging system goes through, the battery doesn't like to be hit with a high amperage charge. It can only tolerate it for a short time. For example, after you start your car, a little short, heavy burst to get it back up again, but that's it. Heavy charges harms batteries. So recharging a depleted battery with a car's charging system is hitting the battery with a high amperage charge. She can't take that very well. That's why, for example, battery chargers usually put out a small amount of current. They could deliver more amperage, but they're deliberately engineered to bring the seriously discharged battery back up slowly to protect the battery. 
Now you might have seen chargers that offer high amperage output or high amperage kicks. Those are for times when simply getting the car running again is more important than the health of the battery, i.e. the charger can be used as a jump starter. At any rate, letting the battery discharge and then bringing it back up to full charge quickly shortens the lifespan of the battery. So if we're going to park our classic car for periods of time, we can completely avoid the harm that a parasitic draw or natural discharge will cause by just simply installing a maintenance charger into the car. Then when we go to start the car, the charging system will not have to work itself more than it was supposed to. The battery will not be subject to a high charge. As Benjamin Franklin helped us to remember, dealing with the problem when it's small, as we can with a maintenance charger, will help us to avoid a bigger, costly, inconvenient problem later.